Hey everybody, welcome to Explorations. My name is Rob. Today we are looking at the Whisperlight liquid fuel stove by MSR. In this video, we're gonna go over setting up the stove, running it, talk a little bit about how it works, go over the pros and cons, and decide if it is the right stove for you for your next adventure. I realize there are like 10,000 reviews of the stove already online, so get ready for number 10,001. So this is the Whisperlite stove by MSR. MSR has three models of Whisperlite stoves. There is the Whisperlite, which is this one, the Whisperlite International, and the Whisperlite Universal. They are all liquid fuel stoves in that they all burn liquid. Uh, the Whisperlite, which is the stove I have here, is meant to run on white gas or naphtha or camp gas, whatever, whatever you want to call it, but it, it's designed and calibrated to run off of that style of fuel. The international and the universal stoves offered by MSR, they function basically the same, but they are made to have run with a wider variety of fuels. Um, there's adapters you can hook on kerosene bottles. Um, I've heard people using things like even diesel or gasoline in them. Um, I don't know if I would personally do that, but it sounds like that is an option. So if you're going somewhere where white gas is not readily available, but things like kerosene are, maybe check out the universal or the international models. So a little bit about the stove that you see in front of you here. This is my personal stove. I've had it for, I want to say like 19 or 20 years. Um, it's worked great for me. I've only had one issue in that whole time of having it, which was very easily solved. Um, it was a pain about to solve it when it happened, but it is rectified now and it works great. Um, I like it a lot, obviously. Uh, I don't really have any real complaints. We will go over the pros and cons later in the video, but yes, this is my stove. It's quite nice. <laughs> So the stove and the valve are 11 and a half ounces. Uh, that weight does not include the fuel bottle. That's just the stove and the valve. The fuel bottle and obviously the fuel itself adds a little bit extra weight. Um, but the stove and the valve all pack into this handy dandy carrying case with a few extra parts, which we'll get to in a moment. So overall, it's a very light system, very compact, very handy for taking on uh, trips where you don't need a large stove. With white gas, this fuel bottle has a life of between about an hour and a half to four hours of burn time. Uh, this is an 887 mil bottle. This is a newer version of it. There's an older version here. Same thing. This one's 975. So you're looking at between an hour and a half to four hours of fuel use, depending on how efficient you're cooking, what you're cooking, how exactly you're using the stove and things obviously like temperature and atmospheric pressure and stuff will also have an impact on that as well. So again, know before you go. So let's start by going over the operation of the stove, how it works, what the parts are. So the stove has three main components. We have the fuel bottle, we have the fuel valve and control, and we have the stove body itself. So basically the way the stove is, you put your liquid fuel into the canister, you pressurize it using the pump, you control the fuel flow with the valve. The fuel is then fed into the stove body where it's vaporized by the heat of the stove through this coil here. It's passed through the generator, and voila, you have fire. Now this is a liquid fuel stove, so it's very important that the liquid gets vaporized, and that is basically how the stove works. So the vaporization happens in this coil right here. Uh, the fuel, liquid fuel is fed up, and it is heated up by the stove itself in this coil. Now as a result of this, it does mean this stove needs to be primed, and most liquid fuel stoves do require some sort of priming. Uh, the way that works is, you get a little bit of fuel into the bowl at the bottom, you light that with your match. That fuel burning at the bottom will be enough to vaporize the fuel in this line. And then once that has vaporized and heated up enough, you'll be able to turn your stove on the rest of the way. And then the stove itself running will be enough heat in order to vaporize the rest of the fuel. And then you are good to go. We will be going all over all of that in a moment when I um, actually put it together and get it set up and running and lit. But that's the basic overview for now. So let's go over what is in the bag when you get the stove and we'll get it set up and running and you'll see what that's all about. So this is what it looks like packed up. Um, I didn't do the best job. You can usually pack it down a little bit smaller. I'm realizing looking at it now that it's a little bulky, but it does pack down a little bit smaller than this. So opening the bag, we have our stove, which is nicely folded up at the moment. We have our fuel valve. We have our instruction manual, which is 
looking a little worse for wear, but that is also included. And we have two heat shields or wind brakes. Uh, one for the bottom underneath the stove and one to go around the stove. So this is what we got. Let's put it together. The stove does not come with fuel bottles. So that is something that you'll have to purchase separately. And obviously it also does not come with fuel. You'll have to purchase that separately as well. White gas or naphtha or camp fuel is pretty readily available in most outdoor hardware stores in, in North America anyways. I can't speak for the rest of the world, but in North America where the majority of our trips happen, it's pretty readily available. Uh, we have here the two different style fuel bottles I have. This was one I got when I originally got the stove 19 years ago. And this is one I got just this year for our Killarney trip. They are functionally the same. They look a little different on top. This one has a locking cap, which is kind of nice. This one is just a regular old screw cap. So first things first, if you don't already have fuel in the bottle, add fuel to the bottle. I highly recommend getting one of these little funnels if you can. This is like three or $4. It's got a, a relatively fine screen in there just to keep uh, debris and stuff from getting into your fuel bottle and possibly clogging up your valve or clogging up your stove. You don't want to do that. So I highly recommend getting a fuel or a funnel, excuse me. So let's open this up. Uh, while I'm doing this, a word on white gas. It is very volatile, meaning it very easily vaporizes. So be careful when you're opening the bottles, when you're taking the stove apart, um, you could get a burst of vapor, which is probably not great to have in your face, but it also does have a, uh, a bit of a flammability hazard. So be careful where you're doing this. Obviously don't be filling your fuel or putting your stove together near already open flames. It's a bit of a recipe for disaster. So, your fuel valve just threads onto your fuel bottle like so. Nice and simple. Oh, I say nice and simple as I cross thread it. There we go. Nice and simple when it's not cross threaded. Put that on finger tight, no need for tools. Do not use tools, you could damage your threads. And then our stove itself has to be unfolded. It's folded up just to keep it a little more compact. So to unfold it, we have to undo this hook, which also doubles as a stand for your fuel line. And then we just separate the feet out like so, until they get into their little locking grooves or locking slots, whatever you want to call it. Next, we are going to put our fuel bottle onto our fuel line. That just pushes on and then we use this to lock the fuel line onto to the fuel valve. So this is a little, it's not flat right now because this has been, um, in the bag so it's a little warped but that will that will level out very quickly next we need to pressurize this fuel bottle in order to force the fuel out of the bottle and into the stove and into the generator so we do that by pumping i believe the manual suggests 30 pumps i want to say on a non-pressurized stove and as you're using the stove you might have to pump it up a little bit more as it's running just to keep the pressure up so the stove is pressurized. We are just about ready to go. One last item we're gonna set up here is we have our two heat shields. The circular heat shield goes underneath the stove to protect your, uh, your fancy picnic tables or sometimes if you're out and about, you might find yourself in an area with a lot of duff on the ground that could be a bit of a fire hazard. So you're gonna to wanna to use that because you do get a little bit of heat reflected down. And I have seen things underneath the stove burn when I haven't used this heat shield. So that is highly recommended. Also, as a must, is this next heat shield slash windbreak. This heat shield shields your fuel bottle from the heat from the stove. I usually kind of lock it into place by folding it in on itself. And this heat shield also doubles as a windbreak which obviously will make your cooking or heating of water or whatever you're using the stove for more efficient because there'll be more heat being trapped within this shield, causing you to use your fuel more efficiently. There is a little notch here for your fuel line to go through, but definitely you want this set up at least to keep the heat away from the fuel bottle. Now I'm not gonna have this set up right now because you can't see what I'm doing, obviously. So we're gonna take this apart. I am gonna keep it separate or keep the fuel bottle separated from the stove just for safety, but we're gonna do it like that for now. 
Generally, I will have that wrapped around. This is just for visibility purposes. So step one, we have to prime the stove. As I mentioned, um, in order for the fuel to vaporize, you need a little bit of heat. The stove is not gonna run properly until the fuel is vaporized. So we're gonna do that by priming. The way priming works is you t use your fuel valve here, open it a little bit, and you'll see fuel begin to accumulate in this cup at the bottom of the stove. So you can see we got getting a little bit of fuel into our bowl here. So once we have a little bit of fuel, or into our cup, excuse me, we will close the valve on our fuel bottle and we'll light that fuel in the bottom of the cup. And there we go. So this flame will heat up the rest of the fuel in the fuel line here and vaporize it, which is what we want. And then once the the stove is up and running. The heat from the stove itself will be enough to heat the fuel on the line. And we won't have to deal with this. So you can see why obviously I want the heat shield here because there's a pretty decent flame when you're priming. And you don't want that flame going near your fuel bottle or your fuel valve. So we'll let this go until the fuel in the cup is just about completely burned off. And once we get to that point, we'll turn our fuel valve on and we should have a nice flame on the top of the stove where it's supposed to be. So we're just about there. Let's see what we can do. The orange flame means it's not quite vaporizing. We're still getting a lot of liquid into it. But now that's turning blue, that is the fuel vapor and that's what you are looking for. So when the stove is running properly, it should just be these nice blue flames. And there you go. The stove is going. I warm my hands up a bit. Woo. Okay. So the fuel valve controls how, how much fuel is going to your stove. So obviously how hot it's going to be. Um, now, unfortunately, it is very hard to control, do fine control on this stove. Um, your settings are basically hot or like really hot. So it's not super great for doing things like cooking things on a lower temperature, simmering, that sort of thing. But uh, we'll get into that when we go through the pros and cons. But yeah, this is how it should look when it's running. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, this will sit a little nicer once you get a bit of weight on it and it's been un unrolled for a bit, but there you go. The whisper light, you can hear it whispering. <laughs> I don't know if that's why they call it a whisper light, but you can definitely hear it. All right, so you've seen it run, you kind of get the idea. Let's turn it off and we'll go talk a little bit about the maintenance of the stove. Um, maintenance is very, very simple. There is maintenance that I do annually and then there's maintenance that I do um, basically before every trip or after every trip or somewhere in there uh, and we'll go through them. So let's start by talking about our annual maintenance because the regular maintenance requires the stove to be cold and it's not cold right now because it was just running. So we're gonna talk about the annual maintenance first. I carry two maintenance kits with me. Um, these do not come with the stove, these are sold separately. We have the smaller maintenance kit here, which is universal amongst all of the MSR Whisperlite stoves. And then we have this larger kit, which is stove specific. So make sure if you're getting these kits, you get the appropriate kit for the appropriate stove. We're not gonna go too heavily into the maintenance here. That, that could be a whole separate video itself, but I'll go through some of the, uh, the quicker, easier maintenance. So annually, I will take the valve apart and I'll look at all the O-rings and make sure they are all in one piece. And I will put grease on any O-rings that look like they're a little dry and require grease. Um, that is all supplied in your basic maintenance kit. You can see that I have a variety of O-rings here. in here. I also have the grease and I have the tools to take this bottle apart. There is also a cup, they call it a valve cup, I think, on the end of your valve here that uses to pressurize um, the bottle. That also needs to be greased and checked regularly because if you have a crack in there or if it's dry, it is not gonna seal and you're not gonna get that pressure buildup. This kit is a has everything in this kit as well, but it has a few extra parts such as the springs, for your fuel valve, it has an extra inlet line. It has It's a little more robust, and um, this is for more serious repairs. So the annual maintenance really only takes about 10 or 20 minutes. It's mostly, mostly just an inspection and a little bit of grease application if required. 
Um, I have yet to have to actually change any O-rings. Um, I did have an issue with this valve, uh, I wanna say like five years ago or so. Um, it just, it wouldn't pump. I was having leaks coming out of the valve stem here. Um, I could not figure it out. <laughs> That's why I ended up getting both of these kits. I tried replacing all the O-rings and everything in here and nothing worked. So I eventually just ended up getting a brand new valve assembly. Sometimes that happens. It sucks when it happens when you're out in the middle of a trip, but sometimes that happens. Um, these valve assemblies are readily available at most outdoor stores or um, stores will th that will sell the stove will also have these replacements as well. Not a super expensive replacement, but um, obviously necessary sometimes. But since then, I've never had to replace any of the O-rings. I've had to apply a little bit of grease to the, the valve cup and that's about it. And that's about it for annual maintenance. It's, it's really, really quite simple, mostly an observation. And like I said, just make sure all the parts are looking like they're in good operating order. Now, my uh, not day-to-day -day maintenance, but trip-to-trip -trip maintenance is super easy. All we're gonna do is we're gonna take this off. You can hear there's a bit of a rattle in the stove. Hopefully you can hear it. I'll put it nice and close. So what that rattle is, there's a little needle floating around in the generator. And if we turn it upside down, I hope you can see a little bit of fuel leaking out the end here. If you turn it upside down and shake, that needle will poke through the hole in the generator and clean out any buildup that you have in there. So if you're in the middle of a trip and you're finding that you're not getting enough fuel through the system, that could be one of the uh, problems. I recommend shaking it, turning it upside down, giving it a shake and see if that needle can cl clear, that, uh, clear that valve. All that's left now is to pack this up and put it away, but I'm not gonna do that on camera. What we are gonna do is go over the pros and cons. First pro is that it is compact and lightweight. You saw that everything, including the maintenance kits, fit in this small bag. This is not a very large bag. Um, the stove itself and the valve, I said weigh what? Like 12? Yeah, 11 and a half ounces. I figure with everything, maintenance kit included in the bag and with all your shields, the whole thing probably weighs about 20 ounces. So it's very lightweight, very compact, very nice, especially if you're hiking or you don't have a whole lot of space for things. This is a really good stove for that. Pro number two is that it is relatively low maintenance. Um, I showed you the maintenance I do every trip, which is this, this. Um, I do recommend doing a quick once over on all your parts just to make sure before you're going on a trip, you don't want your stove to break part way through. But uh, other than that, it's just that little shake pretty much every trip. And then, as I said, once a year, I will go through and do a really close inspection on all the O-rings for my annual maintenance. Pro number three, let's try it one more time because I was looking at the wrong camera. Pro number three, um, longevity. I have had this stove for 19 years and I have never had any problems with it other than that one issue that ended up in me replacing the valve. But for 19 years of use, I would say that is pretty good. I would say it is very well built, built to last. And yeah, longevity, baby. <laughs> My final pro is reusable fuel bottles. Uh, there's a lot of stoves out there on the market that use one-time use fuel bottles or propane bottles. Um, I'm not a big fan of those. I mean, I realize that obviously the bot or the can that provides the fuel for these reusable bottles is not itself reusable, but once you have these bottles, these should be good for the life of the stove, barring any sort of serious damage. One final pro is that it is relatively simple. Um, there's only really the three major parts, the stove, the valve, and your fuel bottle. Um, everything is pretty basic which means it's easy to repair should the need arise. Um, more complex stove, more moving parts, makes things more difficult and harder to fix if you have issues, harder to troubleshoot to find out what those issues might be. So it's a nice simple stove, which makes it real easy for that sort of maintenance and troubleshooting. Okay, so let's get into the cons. Uh, the biggest con for me, and I touched on this earlier, is that it is very hard to control the temperature. Uh, I think, as I said, you're either on hot or very hot. So it's not great for things like bacon or pancakes or simmering soups um, or simmering anything for that matter. You really got to keep a close watch on it. Uh, I found the best thing to do is usually you just hold your frying pan or what have you a little bit higher above the flames because chances are you're not going to be able to get the setting you want for those low temperature cooking applications just using this valve. Another small con, um, I don't really see it as that big of a con, but I know some people don't like it, is that there is no ignition source included as part of 
the stove itself, you have to use a match or a lighter. Um, again, that doesn't really bother me, but I know some people prefer to have like a click button um, sparker on your stoves. So the next con, which I just discovered recently, is that white gas, the fuel the stove uses, does not work well in extreme colds. Uh, I just came back from a camping trip last weekend. It was minus 36 degrees. Uh, minus 36 degrees does not matter if it's Celsius or Fahrenheit because it's basically the same temperature when you're that cold. It, it was very cold. But what I was, I was finding is that this fuel is no longer volatile at that temperature, meaning that it does not vaporize. And based on the fact that the stove functions based on the fuel vaporizing, obviously it was not working very well. Um, it was very hard to get priming. And once I did finally manage to get it primed, it did not run very well. So if you're going somewhere where it's gonna be extreme cold, this might not be the right stove for that. So another con that people complain about, and this is the same for all liquid fuel stoves, it's not just the MSR brand, is that you have to prime them. Um, that is just how liquid fuel stoves function. They rely on the liquid fuel vaporizing, which requires heat, which means you generally have to prime the stove. Again, that is not a big deal breaker for me. That's just how those stoves work. But uh, some people do see it as a con as opposed to a ready to go fuel that you can just put a match to and you're, you're burning. And the final con is that they come, or at least when I got mine, it came with a paper manual. And as you can see, after 19 or so years, it is in, it's still readable, but it's, it's not in the best shape. Um, again, this is not a deal breaker. MSR has very good customer support online. You can find all their manuals online. You can find lots of instructional videos and maintenance videos and stuff online. So it's not the end of the world if this manual were to get destroyed, but I would like to see something a little more robust, something a little more waterproof. But again, not a deal breaker, a pretty minor con as far as I'm concerned. So there you go. That is the Whisperlite liquid fuel stove by MSR. Uh, I like it a lot. Like as I said, probably a couple times already in this video, uh, it's nice and compact. It's easy to carry, easy to use, easy to teach other people to use. And it does everything I need it to do. Uh, it would be nicer if I could control the temperature a little bit better, but obviously it's not a deal breaker because I keep using it. So there you go. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please give us a like and subscribe. It helps us out a lot. And we will see you next time. <clears throat> the big one.